Thanks, Sylvain, for the introduction and the invitation to speak at this uh, nice day of uh, interesting thematic talks. So, indeed, um, this work will be about uh, this talk will be about some work that I did uh, since arriving at IPHT. Um, some of it with Scott Collier, who is a postdoc in Princeton, and some of it with Hinek Paul and Himanshu Raj, who are both in the audience here. They are postdocs at IPHT. And it will be, I think, squarely in the theme of the, of the day. It's certainly a physics talk, but the main idea is to import a tool from the math community and use it to new effect in the context of n equals 4 super Yang mills which is a four-dimensional gauge theory about which we'll talk more uh, momentarily. <coughs> like I said, momentarily. Uh, let's see. Okay, good. So, so, needless to say, in conformal field theory, modularity is everywhere. Um, in two-dimensional CFTs, local observables on the torus must be modular invariant or covariant, depending, uh, with respect to the uh, SL2Z modular group. We know that in Maxwell theory, there is an electric magnetic duality symmetry, uh, which is more of an internal symmetry. There are also various forms of generalized modularity beyond SL2Z of counting functions and superconformal field theories. Uh, the list goes on. Um, but rather than, than continuing the list, I actually happened to stumble upon this slide of Pierre's from a talk uh, some years ago, which <laughs> indeed makes the point very nicely and more pictorially than, than I might have. So um, here he writes Gutzwiller trace formula, Selberg trace formula. You've got quantum physics up in the trees here, um, some graphs, uh, and indeed, modular invariance is everywhere. <coughs> the rest of the slides will be mine, so thank you, Pierre. Um, good, so, so I'd say that the power of modularity in the physics context is that it relates what you might call UV data to IR data. That is, things that are hard to compute uh, or involve a part of the theory that is inaccessible. Uh, on the one hand, these are the UV data, and on the other parts of the theory that are easier to compute, uh, that are more accessible, say, to observation or computation. In two-dimensional CFTs, the SL2Z invariance of the partition function relates the low and high energy spectral densities. This is essentially the Cardi formula. In gauge theory, the SL2Z symmetry maps strong and weak coupling regions of moduli space to each other, and in doing so, exchanges elementary states with solitonic states uh, and indeed forces us to come up with a better invariant notion of what the list of states is. A slightly more adventurous form of modularity that I think is interesting and, and worth bringing up here is that in two-dimensional CFTs you can form grand canonical partition functions where you add a fugacity uh, with a chemical potential dual to the central charge or the number of degrees of freedom. And you can sum over partition functions of different theories in a given sequence uh, in certain cases. And this may have modular properties of its own. These symmetries in that case are relating CFTs with small and large central charges. And so you can ask the somewhat fanciful question, what is the fundamental domain of the space of conformal field theories? Which I've given some uh, you know, heuristic fun picture of over here. And you can imagine that there's some symmetry acting in this space, however one should characterize that, that reduces the number of theories that are essentially independent. So this is fun to dream about. And today I'll, I'll do something a bit more, more modest, uh, which is to discuss SL2Z invariance in gauge theory and the consequences of that symmetry for the physical observables of the theory. So more precisely, we'll talk about the four-dimensional maximally supersymmetric gauge theory, that is super yang mills which is uh, endowed with a gauge group G and a complexified gauge coupling on which the observables depend generically. This is tau, where theta is the topological theta angle, and g is uh, shorthand for g yang mills. <coughs> now tau is exactly marginal. It's a four-dimensional gauge coupling um, in a superconformal field theory. And so it parameterizes what we would call a conformal manifold, uh, which preserves the full n equals 4 superconformal symmetry. So to every point on this space, which I've called m, the conformal manifold m, 
there lives an n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory with a different value of the complexified gauge coupling tau. And so observables furnish a map from the fundamental domain of tau to this conformal manifold. And I've drawn a cusp here where the free theory lives. Okay. Now, why the fundamental domain? Well, that's because n equals 4 super Yang Mills enjoys s duality. This is up to global identifications, uh, and <coughs> given the choice of a simply laced gauge group, an SL2Z invariance of the theory. So a well-defined observable uh, in this theory is either SL2Z invariant or covariant or transforms in some representation such that the whole theory comes back to itself. Again, up to some global identifications which make that statement almost but not quite true. <coughs> now, this symmetry is beyond a reasonable doubt, I would say. It's been the subject of lots of interesting work over the past uh, 40 years, both in the context of field theory and in the context of uh, holography and string theory and the duality of n equals 4 super Yang mills there too. But I would say that the abstract consequences for the observables of that theory have not been fully understood. So what do I mean by abstract consequences? Here I mean what we'd like to call the structural constraints on the observables of the theory, given the existence of the symmetry. For example, the spectrum of local operators or correlation functions should, of course, be constrained by the symmetry, but we'd like to understand how, as a collection, uh, these observables are so constrained. And so here I'm using the point of view of the conformal bootstrap, which is that we would like to characterize or perhaps solve CFTs by using their symmetries and imposing fundamental consistency conditions alone. So, this is a heuristic plot of the kind of thing the conformal bootstrap type approach generates for us. In some space of CFT data, there are regions which are allowed, or in particular, there are regions which are rigorously disallowed. And we imagine that by doing this sufficiently well, we can carve out the space of theories which either exist or are allowed to possibly exist as far as we know. Okay. So that's the philosophy of today's talk. And so, in the context of what I said before, what's the point? We know that n equals 4 has a powerful symmetry, namely s-duality, and we should use it. This is a deeply non-perturbative statement that relates strong and weak coupling, and so it's not immediately clear what to do or how to use it in the way I'm advocating. But there exists some mathematical tools that we can import for the problem, um, and uh, we'll find a lot of mileage uh, in doing so. <coughs> the tool is the spectral theory of SL2Z, that is to say the harmonic analysis uh, of SL2Z on the, fun on the fundamental domain F, sometimes called the modular surface in the math community. We will apply this technique to the SL2Z invariant observables of the theory, uh, which I will call O. This will include things like uh, operator dimensions or uh, certain correlation functions of local operators, and we'll ask what it implies about their structure. This SL2Z spectral theory is very well established. It also still is the subject of lots of cutting edge work in the math community, but we will use mainly the parts that are, that are well established, leaving the other parts to interesting suggestions for, for future understanding in the physics context. <coughs> the upshot is that this S-duality invariant basis gives a new way of looking at the theory, uh, and I think there will be more in the offing in the coming years, or at least I hope so, and I'll try to convince you uh, by presenting a few different facets of what, what this gives us. So the first is that it leads to some new structural results, uh, some of which we discuss, for example, pertaining to the structure of instantons in the theory. Uh, we'll examine a certain explicit uh, infinite class of observables in this theory, which can actually be determined quite explicitly, and which, when cast in this language, become uh, extremely simple, and they're true nature is kind of revealed, I would say. And finally, in the large end limit, there are going to be some interesting relations between this formalism and some other ideas that have been floating around in the context of ADS-CFT, uh, namely that of ensemble averaging. And in this context, we can find a version of these statements that we can prove, um, but I will reserve further discussion of what that bullet point means until, until later. Okay. Okay, so here's an outline for the rest of the talk. Uh, first, I'll introduce my understanding of the aspects of SL2Z spectral theory that we'll need, 
Um, this is a, a big subject, but I'll just try to present what we will need in a kind of uh, physical way. And then we'll apply it to n equals 4 super Young mills. I'll explain how and why it applies. And we'll unravel some of its consequences, um, as mentioned before. The integrated correlator mentioned here, this is this explicit observables that I, that I referred to earlier. And then we'll transition to large n and the relation with uh, string theory and the average over the string moduli space and what that has to do with, with this technique. <coughs> Just a bit of notation. For me, the um, tau parameter will be written as x plus i y. Uh, so y is m tau in particular, and this is essentially 1 over g ang mills squared. So large y is small g, the perturbative regime, good to keep in mind. And I'm going to write functions of tau, but everything is not holomorphic in tau. Okay. All right. So, uh, the basic statement is that a square integrable SL2Z invariant function admits a unique decomposition into an SL2Z invariant eigenbasis, where the eigenbasis, the eigenfunctions themselves, are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the upper half plane. So this uh, um, L2 space has three components. A constant component, a continuous subspace, and a discrete subspace. Okay. I'll say a bit more about these, but just to introduce them very briefly. The constant eigenfunction, well, that's obvious. Um, for reasons <coughs> I'll say in a moment, this I'll refer to as the modular average. The continuous subspace is spanned by the familiar uh, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, where one restricts the index to lie on the so-called critical line, a half plus it, where t is some real parameter. And the discrete subspace, which is perhaps the most interesting, uh, is spanned by what are known as mass cusp forms, which are parameterized by some spectral parameter tn, where n is just some index that runs from 1 all the way up to infinity. There's an infinite number of these guys. Roughly speaking, the continuous part of the um, space of eigenfunctions is smooth, and the discrete part is chaotic. So, before explaining why I use that terminology, the statement of the decomposition is that given some function O of tau, there are three pieces to this decomposition. This constant term, this continuous series, and the sum over the discrete eigenfunctions. And in front of each basis element, there are the overlaps of O with that element. Inner products are taken with respect to the Poincaré metric, like so. And why are we calling these smooth and chaotic? Well, here's a picture before we give some formulas. So this is a picture of four of these functions. More precisely, I've squared them and projected to the zero Fourier mode. Okay. So there's an obvious difference between these curves. The red curve is one of these uh, continuous Eisenstein series, squared and projected. It's a smooth curve. There's a few features, but you know this isn't so, so jumpy, so complicated. But the other three clearly are, and those are the first three lowest lying um, mass cusp forms. Okay, and so those are, you know, what you might expect of a chaotic function. They have sporadic extrema. Um, they the locations and the amplitudes are sort of unpredictable. You might say there are no triple intersections. Uh, which is what you'd expect for a set of three chaotic functions on a two-dimensional domain. Um, and so we'll say a bit more about this now in formulas. Okay. I should say, please ask questions whenever the need arises. So first, the constant. Uh, this is the modular average because it's just the average of O over the fundamental domain uh, with an inverse power of the volume, which recall is finite, even though the fundamental domain is non-compact, where again, um, we're using the Poincaré metric in such calculations. Okay, so simple enough. That's why the O bar notation is there. Um, now the continuous branch spanned by the Eisenstein series. What are these functions? Um, notice I've written E star. There's some index S, but I've added a star to form what's called the completed Eisenstein series by multiplying by the completed Riemann zeta function, like so. This is convenient because this obeys a functional equation uh, which is that it's reflection symmetric under s goes to 1 minus s. The Fourier decomposition is like so. There's a zero mode. Right? So the Fourier decomposition is in x, the real part of tau. 
So here is the zero mode, here are the non-zero modes. The zero mode is just a sum of two powers, obviously symmetric under reflection. And the non-zero modes take this form. Um, the y dependence comes as a Bessel function, and there's some number theoretic prefactor here. The other thing to mention is that this overlap, so this overlap is defined, uh, I didn't actually write this, but having introduced this Riemann zeta function factor here, this overlap is the Peterson inner product divided by the completed Riemann zeta. This is convenient because right, <coughs> this has a functional equation and therefore so does this. So this bracketed overlap is just itself invariant under s goes to 1 minus s. <coughs> the inner product of O with the Eisenstein series is on account of the uh, special properties of the Eisenstein series, just given as a Mellon transform of the zero mode of O. That'll be important. So given the zero mode of the quantity O that you're decomposing, you can reconstruct the Eisenstein overlap and therefore this part of the decomposition. This is known as the Rankine-Selberg transform. <coughs> Finally, onto the cusp forms. These are the most interesting uh, mathematically and the most mysterious. They're functionally similar to the Eisenstein series. Here's their spectral, their uh, Fourier decomposition. Uh, it's again a Bessel function with a spectral parameter as the index. Um, the Fourier coefficients are just written symbolically here because it turns out they're not actually known explicitly in any single case. Before mentioning more about that, just notice that there's no zero mode. So that's an obvious difference with the Eisenstein series. And consequently, these vanish exponentially at the cusp at infinity. Hence the name. So these are infinite in number, but not a single one of them is known analytically. So given some cusp form, say the lowest lying cusp form, say n equals 1, this is going to be one of these kind of jumpy functions whose Fourier coefficients uh, are not known, not even a single one of them, um, except via numerics, which can be done extremely precisely out to a thousand digits, in fact, for the lowest cusp forms. Um, and likewise, for the spectral parameter, we don't actually know any of these spectral parameters, any of these eigenvalues in closed form for any of these objects. But a lot is known, either at small n numerically or uh, at large n via various universality arguments that essentially stem from um, uh, the theory of chaos. So here's a picture of what is known. You can go to uh, this site here and get a lot of information about, about these these forms. Here I've taken the <coughs> lowest lying cusp form, which is even under x goes to minus x. They're either even or odd. Uh, here's the lowest lying even one. So these a's are the Fourier coefficients in a certain norm where the leading coefficient is set to one. This is the so-called Hecke norm. Uh, here's the spectral parameter out to a bunch of decimal places. For this guy, like I said, these are known out to a thousand digits, <laughs> but here's just a picture of some of what's known, freely accessible on the internet. So it's fun to play around. So why are the cusp forms so elusive? Uh, they are chaotic. I should note it's arithmetic chaos, not chaos characteristic of uh, you know, Gaussian random matrices. Um, uh, but still, they are chaotic. And that is kind of, let's say, the physical explanation for why we don't know these things explicitly. Um, but that's also the physical explanation for why they have this sporadic behavior, and certain large-n universal properties. <coughs> so here are two pictures. Um, I've chosen two cusp forms with different spectral parameters, and I've taken a density plot of these somewhere in the upper half plane, right? So I've drawn the fundamental domain. These look different, but similar. Uh, you know, they are elegant and they're pretty, but they're hard to describe exactly. This is the result of some numerical experiments uh, by Hedgehall and Rackner from uh, almost 30 years ago. Um, so besides just staring at them to get a feel for them, one aspect of their sporadicness is the following. If you ask where are their global minima and maxima, they're in random places. So from the physicist's point of view, we often associate global extrema to features of some domain. So for example, the Eisenstein series is globally minimized here at the corner, but these things, they have extrema wherever. Okay. So this one has a global maximum here, global minimum here. This one has a global maximum here and a global minimum here, just deeply in the interior of the fundamental domain. Okay. And if you change the spectral parameter a little bit to go to the next one, they'll jump around unpredictably. <coughs> 
the large N universality can be sort of put under a certain umbrella of what's called the random wave conjecture, which is essentially the statement that as you look at large eigenvalue, these all approach what look like some random superposition of, of Bessel functions. Um, there are various avatars of this. It's not so relevant for what I'm going to say later, but you know, this is the interesting part of the decomposition in some way, so I wanted to highlight it. Um, and I should say that we don't understand what this chaos or the arithmeticity of the chaos means in the CFT context. So I won't really say much more about this, I'm just highlighting it for future thought. Okay, so back to n equals 4. The statement is simple. In any CFT, well-defined observables are finite at all values of the coupling, perhaps away from some boundaries of moduli space if there is one. Now in n equals 4, the only feature of the moduli space, the only boundary is the cusp at infinity, but that's just where the free theory lives. So well-defined observables are finite there. They just asymptote to their free values. So in particular, they are square integrable and therefore admit a spectral decomposition. So that's that. In a way, that's the main claim. And now we're just going to process the consequences of, of this observation. You should contrast this with 2D CFT partition functions, which is another natural place you might think to apply this formalism. But 2D CFT partition functions diverge exponentially at the cusp. So one needs to use care to apply these methods there. Um, I learned about these methods from my co-authors on a paper from 2021. Um, where we were able to say something about this in the 2D CFT context, uh, but I won't say more here, only to just highlight that in n equals 4 super Young mills, that the formalism sort of fits like a glove. In this context, you, you have to be careful, and it's a bit more puzzling um, what some of those subtleties mean. Okay, so let me pause and ask if there are any questions before proceeding. I mean, wh why do you know that uh, observables are, are square integrable? I mean, why, are they, why are they square integrable? Just because they don't diverge in the cusp or because they're controlling the cusp? Yeah, that's right. And so in the interior, they, they are finite. The only place they could possibly diverge would be at a cusp, but the cusp is the free theory. And that. And you, know, you know how they behave at the cusp? Yes. Okay. So I, so I want to make a philosophical comment. Let me underscore the, the use of having found a complete basis. Okay. The overlaps are the observable. It's like going to momentum space. You should resist the temptation to revert to tau space. These are the things that you want to compute. You don't have to plug them back in here. So we can ask, in this language, in this spectral space, do things look nice or not? And if they look nice, then you've, you're onto something. Okay. And again, the, the fact that it's a complete basis is, is critical for making this statement, because you can then systematically classify the complexity of the coupling dependence of a given observable by asking about the functional complexity of the overlaps. Without a basis, you can't do that. Okay. <coughs> so now let's ask, what are the physical constraints on these from the fact that we're working in a gauge theory? Um, I'll I'll start with a basic one, which is that we need a consistent perturbation theory. So the overlaps have to have certain properties. Right? Now, in n equals 4 super Young mills the Fourier number is the instanton number. So k here is the total instanton number of some observable O. Um, so OK is the expansion around some k instanton background. And so we want to impose that there's a consistent perturbative expansion for whatever O is, correlator an operator dimension, etc. So here's the zero mode. The non-zero modes are exponentially suppressed in Y. That means exponentially suppressed in uh, one of our Giang mills. So we ignore them. We focus on the zero mode. And to develop the perturbative expansion, it's clear from this what you do. You have to deform the contour to uh, the left to pick up poles, which give you the appropriate um, powers of 1 over Y. And therefore, this overlap has to have the appropriate polar structure to give you the allowed powers of g ang mills. That is to say, only integer powers of g ang mills squared, only positive integer powers, no logs. And so that leads you to this pretty constrained functional form of the overlap. Here are the poles that you get in perturbation theory times some function, which we called fp of s. p stands for perturbative. The values on the integers encode the weak coupling data of whatever you're looking at. 
And to this, you can add some regular function fnp, which encodes possible non-perturbative effects that augment the perturbative expansion around weak coupling. So there are these two functions of s, which one needs to determine, and that fully determines the overlap with the Eisenstein series. Okay. And again, the cusp forms are not relevant for this part because they decay exponentially. So we're not cheating, they just don't enter into this, this part of the, the theory. <coughs> you can show with a little work that these functions, fp and fnp, are reflection symmetric under s goes to 1 minus s. Um, they are real for real s, and they're regular almost everywhere, save for a possible pole at s equals 1, or its reflection, which actually has to cancel between the two to give a regular overlap. Okay. Okay, so now let's demonstrate the utility of this on a certain explicit observable, which is a certain set of integrated correlation functions. So n equals 4 super Young mills comes with an infinite tower, uh, well, for generic n anyway, an infinite tower, let's just say a tower, of half BPS operators, OP, where P runs from 2, 3, dot, 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 uh, on up um, to n. The stress tensor multiplet corresponds to the p equals 2 operator. These have dimension delta equals p, and they are protected by, by supersymmetry, as mentioned. So we can compute their four-point functions. This is often done in the context of, of the bootstrap or, or general studies of the theory. And let's call the part of the four-point function which is not fixed by superconformal ward identities h 22 pp So we've taken two of the p equals 2 operators and two of the p operators, and we're looking at that four-point function. <coughs> this depends on cross ratios u and v, and on the coupling tau. Now in general, we, we don't know this. We know some stuff about some pieces of it, but we don't know the unintegrated correlator. But it turns out that if you integrate it over the cross ratios against a certain pretty vanilla measure, which I'm not writing here, then it can actually be computed explicitly and exactly for all n and tau. And the trick is that you can relate this integral to something which is computable by supersymmetric localization. It's quite remarkable given that this is a complicated object about which we know very little, but then this, which now just depends on the coupling tau and not on the cross ratios, uh, can be determined. For p equals 2, this was determined conjecturally and more recently proven uh, by Doragoni, Green, and Wen in a nice paper. The formula they wrote down takes the form of a lattice integral so there's a double lattice sum, a uh, one-dimensional integral of this simple exponential factor times some kernel bn of xi, where again, n is the n of, sorry, I should have said, we're looking at sun, n equals 4 super Young mills. So n is the, the rank of the gauge group. Okay. Sorry, but why would you want to compute it, to compute the integral, I mean? The unintegrated object is more interesting. Absolutely, yeah. But it's very hard. Uh, if we had that, then we would have an infinite amount of data about the n equals 4 theory at some value of n, but the integrated thing is some intermediate object between nothing and the thing we would ideally like to have, and it is pretty amazing that it can be computed exactly in tau using some other method. So just to say it another way, it's computable by, by localization, but it still depends on tau. So it's in this sweet spot. I don't really know many observables that one can write down an expression for, which is not just some sort of n-fold integral which grows with n, exactly in tau. The formula I wrote down is valid for all n and tau. The tau dependence is, is simple. The n dependence just enters here. And this is just a rational function involving Jacobi polynomials. Here I give an example for n equals 2. And the higher n are determined recursively by what they call the Laplace difference equation, which I write here. The action of the Laplacian on G2 can be related to shifts involving n. Okay. So you said you don't know many other examples. Do you know any? Um, if we're talking about local observables, uh, or rather th things that, well, no, no, no. I, I think there are, yeah, non-trivial, uh, <laughs> non-trivial observables, let's just say. I personally don't. Do you? No, okay. I, I have the sense that maybe in the world of extended objects there are some things that are not exactly, but um, that, that's why I, I was genuinely asking because I, I'm more of a local guy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah.
yeah, l lest that be interpreted defensively, I genuinely want to know because I would love to apply this technique to, to, the, to, to those situations. Okay, but yeah, this seems to be a unique object even in the world of n equals 4. Okay. <coughs> so now let's go to the spectral basis. A and, and before doing so, you know, I'd say this formula, it, its existence is great. It's extremely elegant, but you'd like to know, you know where this comes from, why this takes the functional form that it does. And so it's useful to go to a basis. So we'll go to the spectral basis and we'll ask what happens. And the answer is that they just become polynomials. <coughs> the cusp form overlap vanishes. The non-perturbative piece of the Eisenstein overlap vanishes. And the remaining piece, this fp, which I've now given some, some index here, um, is just a polynomial, which is determined by a recursion relation. For SU2, it's just 2s minus 1 squared. For SUN, you just fix it by using this relation, which is equivalent to that Laplace difference equation I wrote before. So this is quite remarkable. Um, the polynomial structure extends to all p. This is work that Himantu and Hinek and I did um, a couple months ago. So we looked at these two 2pp correlators, not just the p equals 2 case that uh, was studied before. Um, and the same thing happens, cusp form overlap vanishes, non-perturbative overlap vanishes, the perturbative piece is just some polynomial, um, and it can be determined by a nice recursive relation, which then starts to involve shifting n and p, like this uh, very nice formula here. So let me emphasize the power of this polynomial property. Recall that if we allow ourselves for a moment to go back to tau space, <laughs> Um, the perturbative expansion from the zero mode looks like so. There's the average piece, um, there's the integral, and here's our polynomial. Th this used to be fp. It turns out that it always takes the form of 2s minus 1 squared times some other polynomial, gp. This has degree, in all cases we've, we've studied, uh, and we believe for all p, this has degree 2n plus 2p over 2 minus 6. So what that means is that the integrated correlator is completely determined by the first n plus p over 2 minus 2 orders in perturbation theory. Because I deform the contour to pick up the first several poles, I match them to the perturbative expansion, that fixes the free coefficients in this polynomial, and then I'm done, because this is the full answer in the zero mode sector. But all there is is Eisenstein. The cusp forms vanish. Right. So somehow, these things that at first looked like they depended on tau non-trivially boil down just to polynomials when viewed in the right basis. <laughs> So personally, I find this application to be very suggestive that we need to think more deeply about coupling dependence in general in this theory. <coughs> um, having said that, an obvious question is why the cusp form overlap vanishes for these observables. Why physically? What is the physical principle that makes that so? What is the meaning of the absence of the arithmetic chaos associated to the cusp forms? And will it still be true that when you have cusp form overlap, say for some more generic observable in the theory, the spectral basis is useful. That's not so clear. There are functions which can be written down totally explicitly in a Fourier decomposition, but whose spectral decomposition is, is opaque or has to be written in terms of some implicit L functions. Um, but I think this case is so striking that it deserves further, further thought. <coughs> okay, so let me derive a couple general results on the structure of instantons in n equals 4. And here the spectral decomposition is crucial. Okay, so we're going away from the explicit example of this observable and then back to what are the consequences of this whole formalism for the theory. So the first is actually that instantons in this theory are redundant. By which I mean that the k greater than 1 instanton sectors are uniquely determined by the k equals 0 and k equals 1 instanton sectors. This is a very strong statement, so let me try to explain it. When the cusp form overlap vanishes, this is clear. Right? We take the zero mode, we compute the inner product by using the rankin selberg transform, and then that gives us all the higher k instanton modes just by expanding the Eisenstein series and the spectral decomposition in the k instanton sector. So you're done. Now, when you have non-zero cusp form overlap, the most non-trivial part of the statement is that these overlaps may be instructed by inverting the composition using a certain orthogonality relation for Bessel functions. So that is to say, 
if you write down the k equals 1 instanton sector of the observable, you can actually pick off overlap by overlap the cusp form overlaps. So once you have those, you have the cusp form overlaps, you have the Eisenstein overlaps, you have the whole thing. It must be emphasized that this last property assumes that the cuspidal eigenspectrum of SL2C <coughs> is non-degenerate. This is widely believed to be true, but it's not proven. In fact, the, the best known bound, as far as I'm aware, is pretty far. So the anticipated bound is that all cusp forms are unique, right? So the degeneracy is less than or equal to one for any given value of the spectral parameter. But the best known bound is logarithmically growing in the spectral parameter. Okay, that's, that's very big compared to one. But it's widely believed to be true, and with this standard assumption, uh, this redundancy property holds. Yes? What does this mean at large n, where the asymptotes become less and less relevant? Oh, um, large n of SUN, say? Yes. W what does it mean? Um, the fact that, uh, that you, like, what, what information is contained in this then? Because uh, it seems that uh, it's, maybe it's that the, this one asymptote sector is very important somehow. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that anything sharp, um, I'm not sure I can say anything sharp about that. It, it's true that, yeah, I mean, um, you know, if, if you work at large n and fixed g-yang mills, then instantons are important, you might say as important as at finite n. If you work in like the Tuft limit, then they become non-perturbatively small. Um, and, yeah, so I'm not sure that this really has any bearing on that, but yeah. So this is, okay, this is for fixed GM. Yeah. 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 Is there some relation to, to the theory of resurgence and the fact that these instantons are controlled by the perturbative expansion? Yeah, I, I'd like to... I, yeah, it's a good question in, in that I think this is a much stronger conclusion than one usually gets from the theory of resurgence where you have... T typically, when that works, you have to work in a fixed k sector and do resurgence of the perturbative expansion around k instantons. This is telling you that <laughs> once you know the, the lowest two sectors, you know them all. Sometimes in the resurgence community, there's this, they talk about the resurgence triangle, which is really just a statement that you... So <laughs> draw the different k sectors somehow in, ro in columns and there's some triangle happening. Um, this is saying you, you can move horizontally in this triangle, which is unusual in that, in that context. So, so what, what can be said? I, I think you'd like to understand somehow the semi-classical resurgence explanation for this, from that language. I haven't thought about this. I think it would be nice to do. Um, yeah, somehow SL2Z is very powerful. And yeah, but we haven't... Yeah, and actually the thing I'm going to say next suggests this, that we should look at this even more. Okay, so the second property I want to say about instantons <coughs> has to do with their asymptotics. So l let me introduce a technical tool, then the next slide will make use of it. We introduced what we called an SL2Z Borel transform. If you have some asymptotic expansion of some function, f of y, so think of this as like the zero mode of O, okay, so some perturbative expansion with coefficients c sub n, then we can form the Borel uh, uh, transform by dividing not by the usual gamma function, but by this completed Riemann zeta function. The reason this is nice and that we call this the SL2Z Borel transform is that this completed Riemann zeta is what appears naturally in the perturbative expansion because that's this coefficient in the Fourier mode of the Eisenstein series. So when you divide by this, you are in a sense respecting SL2Z symmetry more than if you just use the standard Borel transform where you divide by a gamma function. It can be nicely inverted because the Mellon transform of the Jacobi theta function gives back this and has various nice properties. Um, which were observed in the context of this integrated correlator just empirically by Dorgoni, Green, and Wen, but here you can see that it's a universal consequence of SL2Z when you think about it in this way. So, okay, if you have some asymptotic series, you need to compute the Borel transform and you'd like to ask whether it's Borel summable. The suggestion is that in this theory for SL2Z invariant observables, you should use this transform. And this transform has some beautiful property. So, a natural question given this redundancy property I mentioned is, if the zero mode is Borel summable, then are the higher modes also Borel summable? So for the moment, well, yeah, that, that's the question. It's not obvious given the form of the, 
Fourier decomposition of the Eisenstein series. So let's ignore cusp forms for the sake of exposition. Right, a, a given pole in the, in the perturbative expansion in the zero mode comes with the power of one over y. But for the non-zero modes, all values of s, all poles, contribute their own vessels, and they all contribute equally. In the large y expansion, they all contribute on the same footing. So it's not clear whether the one implies the other. But the answer turns out to be yes. All the higher instanton sectors all are Borel summable if the zero instanton sector is, that is to say if standard perturbation theory around zero instantons is. And there's a really nice relation between the convergence radii of these transforms. So if I look at the SL2Z Borel transform of the zero mode and define an asymptotic radius of convergence by looking at the large M asymptotics of this, this sum, and do the same for the K instanton sector, then these are related in this extremely simple way. <coughs> you can check this for the integrated correlators. Uh, how does this pop up? Well, it turns out there it's easy to see that R is 1, and then RK turns out to be the max over P and Q of P plus Q squared, where P and Q are constrained like so, and it's easy to see that this is just 1 plus K squared, which is nice. Okay, so um, that's it for the sort of, let's say, pure traditional field theory questions that this can, can help us address. Let me pause and ask if there are any questions before moving to the last, the last part. I mean, here everything depends, was, was projected on the Eisenstein series. Yes. We did not project anything on the yes. forms because they are the cusp form because uh, they decay too fast? Or? Uh, no, you're right. One in general needs to include the cusp forms because in the k equals one sector they, they would contribute. Um, we have a, a generalized version of this result in the paper. Um, uh, uh, let, let me not quote it, but it exists and it's, it's the one place where we could actually use the fun number theoretic properties of these cusp forms. So in particular there's this Ramanujan conjecture that the in the norm where the leading coefficient is normalized to one, the other Fourier coefficients have amplitude bounded above by two. Um, this has not been proven. A version, some progress toward this has been proven by Kim and Sarnak. If you use their best bound, you can actually show that um, there is a result that, that pops out that generalizes this in a relatively simple way. So the radii are related by the minimum of this and some other quantity which I refer you to the paper to see. But yes, we can treat that case too. Thanks. Is it possible to reformulate uh, similar claims in terms of parallelization group flow, uh, in, terms of t in terms of tau? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Which... Well, for instance, when we consider n equals two situation, you could write down the kind of formalization group, which is first order uh, in, the, in tau equation. And here we, we consider the second order in tau. Is it possible to relate to them in some way? Hmm. I have not thought about this. I don't know. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah. Um, we were sort of, you know, happily ignoring, happily s sitting in the conformal phase the whole time. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a nice question. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. <coughs> so finally, on to large n and some related consequences. And then we'll conclude. So, in fact, let's not go to large n yet. Okay. <laughs> so one other thing that the spectral decomposition is nice for is the following. In a general CFT, which has exactly marginal couplings, we can average observables over those couplings. So given some O, here I'm calling the general set of couplings lambda, integrate O against some measure in lambda <coughs> over the conformal manifold. This would define some average O, which I denote by these brackets. A natural choice of measure in this business is to use the Zamologikov measure, which is formed from the uh, Zamologikov metric itself, the matrix of two-point functions of the exactly marginal operators. <coughs> so let me make that choice henceforth. 
Why would I make that choice henceforth besides it being natural? Well, it turns out that in n equals 4, maximal supersymmetry implies that the Zemlogikov metric is simply the Poincaré metric. So, in fact, the ensemble average, so defined, is just the modular average. Right? This is just dx dy over y squared, exactly, because the Zemlogikov metric is just uh, 1 over y squared times, uh, you know, the tau tau bar common is 1 over y squared. So the ensemble average equals the modular average. And since the modular average was just the constant term in the spectral decomposition, the ensemble average appears very naturally in this language, which is interesting. So if you want to know the average value of some observable over the whole space of n equals 4 theories, uh, the spectral decomposition kind of spits this out as the leading term in a nice way. <coughs> just for some context, the p equals 2 integrated correlator has an average n, n minus 1 over 4. That's pretty simple. For a certain family of general p integrated correlators that we computed, uh, this is appended by some linear combination of harmonic numbers. Here p is even, actually, for this family, so this ends up being some, um, some simple uh, rational function. Okay, okay so why did ensemble averages sneak in here? Why physically should you care? So let me give two answers. <coughs> so one is just from the abstract CFT point of view. When we solve the conformal bootstrap, whether we're solving crossing equations or some other bootstrap type equation, we have some map that we're converging toward of the space of CFTs. We can think of these bootstrap solutions as a kind of ensemble. You can then ask, what are these statistics of CFT data within these islands? What is a typical theory that is allowed in this universality class? Traditional bootstrap doesn't do this. It shrinks the edges of the allowed regions. But it would be nice to know the typical value of some quantity inside some such island. <coughs> in a CFT with exactly marginal couplings, there's a more literal notion of ensemble, just the space of theories on this fixed line or the conformal manifold. And so you can ask versions of this question quantitatively and try to answer them. So we can ask, what are the statistics of CFT ensembles defined by conformal manifolds M? How do these statistics relate to other properties of M, say whether it's compact or non-compact? And any number of other related questions. The point just being this is a concrete context to address this more general ambition when we study the class of uh, the space of CFTs. <coughs> Answer number two comes from holography. <coughs> More, well, let's say in the past few years, there have been some developments which have discovered a duality between matrix ensembles uh, and theories of simple gravity in two dimensions. This is this JT, random matrix theory duality, discovered by these folks here. In greater than two bulk dimensions, it's believed that Semi-classical Einstein gravity is, in some sense, also a theory of averages. This idea seems to conflict with traditional notions of how bulk theories of gravity are dual to individual microscopic large NCFTs. There's been a lot of work about understanding how exactly these ideas might be compatible. <coughs> uh, some of which I've quoted here, but there are many, many of them. Um, and so, in our context, in n equals four super Yang Mills. We can seek some kind of rigorous version of these statements by thinking of the ensemble, again, in this literal way, because we have a conformal manifold. And we can ask whether there seems to be some relation to the general ideas floating around about averages and holography or not. Okay, so that's some motivation. What will we actually find? Well, here I'll just walk through, sketch the calculation that leads to an interesting result. Let's consider the Tuft double scaling limit of large n, small g, fixed lambda. Some observable O will admit a genus expansion if O is some low energy observable like you know, the conformal dimension of the Konishi operator um, or something, uh, a correlator of local operators. And in the spectral decomposition, we can ask how the Tuft limit uh, looks and we can develop, say, the large Tuft coupling expansion and see what pops out. Now, only the zero mode matters. The non-zero modes are exponentially suppressed in n, because right, when you write 1 over g-ang mills in terms of n and lambda, there's an, there's an n. 
So we can safely ignore the cusp forms here. We just look at the zero mode. What do you do? Well, this has a genus expansion, which one can understand on general grounds. And this is just some function of y, which you rewrite in terms of n and lambda. You do some processing of this integral, so you have some contour integral. You ask if I'm developing a large n, large lambda expansion, which way must I deform it, and so on. And the result is that everything from the spectral integral part is suppressed at large n and large lambda. So we're going to strong coupling in this Tuff limit, and we find that you have this constant term, but everything else is subleading in 1 over n and 1 over lambda. This constant term itself admits a large n expansion, but it doesn't depend on lambda. Right? It's independent of the coupling. <coughs> so this is a very interesting statement, uh, which we can phrase this way. We found some equivalence between the large n limit of the ensemble average and the strongly coupled limit of that quantity in the Tuff limit. This is equivalent to the supergravity value in NDS5 times S5 by standard holography. So we can sort of write it as this triple equality. This one is just standard holography. The non-trivial one is, is this or this. Okay. Now, I want to emphasize that the traditional ADS-CFT dictionary still holds. What we're finding is that the ensemble average is emergent at strong coupling in large n and ends up being equivalent to the supergravity strongly coupled answer. But if you were to work at finite n, or a finite coupling, you should do what you normally do in ADS-CFT. This is just another way to think about this strongly coupled limiting point. Here we restricted our attention to observables O, which had a genus expansion, so not states involving heavy operators like black holes, but rather low energy observables. So we can check this, for example, for the integrated correlator, once again, using this as our benchmark. Um, the large lambda um, planar expansion was developed by these authors. They found this for the leading answer. In our work, we look at the average. You expand it a large n, you find this, and the leading terms indeed match. Okay. I should also say this extends to all genera. So this statement is a statement about the leading order large n limit of the average. But if you look order by order in the genus expansion, and to find this double bracketed quantity to be the large n limit of the genus g, the average of the genus g part of the observable, then this is equivalent to the strongly coupled limit of the genus g part of the observable. <coughs> Making this precise involves some non-trivial rearrangement of the large n expansion, um, but from the bulk point of view, you should think of this as the finite term remaining after string theory regularizes the divergence of g loop supergravity. And so it's interesting that the average in the large n limit, order by order in the genus expansion, lands on that string theory regularization. So there's no order one coefficient here that depends, say, on g. In, in this quantity gp of n that you've computed here, yeah. so this in the bulk, this means that you've computed the scattering of two gravitons with any PP uh, operator inserted in like all the Witten diagrams and you've, you've integrated all of that? Well, if you did that, <coughs> then you would get this, yes. <coughs> but instead, what they did was compute using supersymmetric localization and then take the tough limit of that result. But yes, the, the two would match, yeah. Because right, you, if you did that, you'd, you'd integrate it over Cross ratios, but using localization, you just jump. You just jump to this, right? Yeah. So this, these authors, that was the content of their paper. So it makes so to say it another way, these results make predictions for integrated correlators. You know, had you the unintegrated one, you can integrate it and check. Um, and this becomes especially non-trivial at loop level. So like this here, can be massaged into a prediction for the integral of the one-loop amplitude. And so, given some information about the one-loop amplitude, which is out there in the literature, uh, this is a checkable statement, we think. But we didn't, we didn't pursue that. <coughs> OK, so a couple comments about um, how this fits into recent ideas about averaging in ADS-CFT, just for, for completeness. So again, to emphasize, we're doing an actual average over moduli and then taking a large n limit. In doing so, we could derive a statement of this gravity equals averaging kind of slogan that seems to be uh, relevant for thinking about ADS-CFT for low energy observables like correlators. 
On the other hand, in the general idea CFT discussion, um, that's not really the nature of what is being discussed. First of all, there are not always moduli in ADS compactifications, and the averaging that seems to have something to do with Einstein gravity is an apparent averaging because of the absence of moduli. And it's an apparent averaging that seems to affect the high energy or black hole spectrum, um, which Schlenker and Witten gave some heuristic arguments, um, might be due to nature, the nature of chaos combined with the large end limit. Okay. But th these are different kinds of regimes and different kinds of calculations. But the point is that in sacrificing some sort of abstractness, one can derive something, and it has something in common, nevertheless, despite these differences. I would say for the future, though, studying high energy or black hole observables in our formalism would be useful. These don't have been a genus expansion, so th these formulas don't apply, but it would be nice to, to think about those kinds of things here. So I'll conclude in a few minutes. Um, the last computation I want to present, though, I think is a, um, is a natural follow-up to what we were just discussing, which is, well, you have this SL2Z ensemble, let's call it. That's just a fun way of saying the space of n equals 4 theories parameterized by, by tau. And we can ask, what are the statistics of this ensemble? As advertised earlier, this is something that we can, we can try to do. Uh, and this formalism lets us, this, this spectral formalism, lets us do this very nicely. <coughs> so to, sh to show, first of all, that this is actually non-trivial even for the average itself, l let me consider observables where the non-perturbative part of the overlap is zero, just for simplicity of presentation. The average in the 1 over n expansion takes the form, the supergravity answer, plus terms down by integer powers of n. But based on the structure of string theory, the unaveraged observable will have its first correction down by n to the 3 halves. So these are, you know, odd half integer powers. So something about the averaging changes the systematics of the large n expansion. In other words, large n and averaging don't commute. So there's something nice to understand about this ensemble in the large n limit, and of course at finite n. So I'll present one calculation and then conclude. The first thing you might think to compute if you're trying to understand the statistical correlations in some ensemble is the variance. So given some O, we can compute the variance defined like so. This is just the averaged two-point function of O minus its average. And so we can compute this nicely using, by inserting a complete set of states in physics language, otherwise known as Parseval's theorem in math language. And you get a nice formula in terms of the overlaps. So it's just the second moment in spectral space of the overlaps of O with the basis elements. At large n, you can insert the genus expansion of the overlap and ask how this looks. It turns out the variance is suppressed relative to the squared average by 1 over n. So you could say that the ensemble is peaked around the supergravity value with width 1 over n. Let's check this versus the integrated correlator for p equals 2. Right here's the large n prediction, but we have this thing for all n recursively, so you can just compute the variance exactly and compare it to the large n limit. So in large n, after normalizing by some powers of n, this combination gives you this number, which I've plotted as a line here, and compare this to exact calculations of the variance for finite n, from n equals 2 all the way up to n equals, I think, 107, and you can see the asymptotic uh, matches nicely. I think it would be worthwhile to explore the higher statistics of this ensemble, either at finite n and at large n, uh, but we, we deferred that uh, to, to future work. There should also be some nice non-perturbative effects operating, some of which we, we uncovered, but, but others which remain to be seen. Okay. okay, so let me summarize. I think this SL2Z spectral theory is a potent tool for studying S-duality and equals four super Yang mills. It provides us a complete basis, which is moreover manifestly invariant under this non-perturbative symmetry for SL2Z invariant n equals 4 observables. And I think for sure we should try to understand its implications further, uh, not in n equals 4 alone, but also in other settings where SL2Z appears, some of which I mentioned earlier with the help of Pierre. So um, let me conclude there. Some questions for your um, perusal, but I'll stop here. Thanks.
d'autres questions. Is it possible to consider the level spacing distribution in this uh, spectral theory? Like in generic chaotic system, uh, it's usual object to, to look uh, around to level spacing distributions, Poissonian or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it possible to consider this, this here? Do you mean um, in, the, in the set of eigenfunctions for SL2Z yeah, yeah, itself? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this has been the subject of a lot of study. Um, <coughs> so these cusp forms, have a Poissonian distribution of eigenvalues. It's because the chaos is what's called arithmetic chaos, which owes us essentially to some special symmetries inherent to the fact that you're looking at the fundamental domain of SL2Z, which is like a nice space uh, in, in, in a certain sense. There are some extra, there's an infinite set of extra symmetry generators which act on this space, which in a way are responsible for the arithmeticity of this chaos and lead to this Poisson distribution. So the early observations were experimental, um, I think they still somewhere lie between experimental and theoretical, but it's, it's well established that this is not a standard RMT ensemble. Um, and yeah, so... so and, and is that. there a kind of mobility H in this case? Uh, a kind of what? Uh, mo mobility H which di distinguish, so you have a different part of the spectrum, one is Poissonian and mm. one is uh, uh, random. I don't think so. I don't think there is a part which is uh, random. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think not. Um, there are small, you know, generalizations of the modular group where arithmeticity goes away. Some of these Hecke triangle groups with certain choices, uh, apart from a cer certain few select choices, these are non-arithmetic and they do see non-Poissonian statistics of the eigenvalue spectrum. Um, those actually, yeah, so, so a natural question in the CFT context is to ask about CFTs whose um, S-duality groups are these non-arithmetic groups. I think that would be fun to use this technology there to the extent that you could. Um, yeah. One more question. Sure. Uh, uh, when you consider the scattering on the modular group, uh, uh, modular region, uh, it's, uh, the, the related object uh, can be identified with a zonal spherical function for PAD group. Uh, do we have uh, any relation with PIDCity uh, in this uh, mm. case? <coughs> That's a nice suggestion. I have no idea. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In general, I actually don't really know. There are a lot of things known about this space, the pr properties of the geodesics or the nodal domains, which I don't really have any field theory interpretation of, I'd like to understand that, that better. Um, yeah, but definitely no, no understanding of whether piadicity is at work somehow in the field theory. Thanks. Do you know any similar results for in exact integrated correlators in other theories, maybe in n equal two theories? Um, let's see. So there are these, well, I guess as there are these versions um, which live on defects um, in this theory. Um, in n equals two, um, no, no. Um, and, and there, yeah, e even the, the two-point functions, you know, which one doesn't need to integrate to get just a function of tau alone, are, are more complicated. And in, so in like these n equals two super QCD theories where there's an SL2Z action, you could try to apply this technique and in principle, those observables would admit a decomposition. But if you look at their expansion in, in perturbation theory, they're functionally more complicated and it seems that their spectral decomposition would be hard to write down. Um, so, but the short answer to your question is no. Um, but it would be really nice to find some. Yeah, I'm sorry. I still don't don't see where the cusp forms came out, came out or came up in your uh, in your decompositions of uh, observables or averages of observables. I mean, all, all you showed were expansions in the in the scattering scattering sector that is in the Eisenstein series, and somehow, but the discrete spectrum, uh, where does it pop up? Does it pop up anywhere, or is it just a side of this uh, of these observables? Yeah, I would say in general it pops up. It, 
it should pop up generically for the decomposition of some generic observable in this theory. It's no surprise that the one we could compute explicitly has no cusp form support. So I showed you the example where which we actually have under control, which even is, is kind of a unique example of its type, only recently discovered. Shows how hard it is to compute things exactly, even in this nice theory. Um, and in perturbative regimes and in the Tuff limit, therefore, they don't appear for, for reasons of the limit. So now those formulas you asked about, they could be generalized to include cusp forms, but I think the theme of what I was trying to convey was that a lot can be understood even in regimes where the cusp forms don't enter. The other half of that is that when the cusp forms are relevant, it's hard to make analytic statements. That, that for sure is true. Um, so, but, so one of the major outstanding questions is, you know, I mean, yeah, what, what these imply for the physics of the theory, if you have some theory, some, ob some object which has support on the cusp forms, um, in what sense can you call it more chaotic? It, besides the trivial sense, yeah. So, so no, it's, it's for a combination of presentational but also physical reasons that I had less to say about that. You showed before that the, uh, the variance at leading order in the large M expansion uh, goes like one over M. Uh, and this, uh, maybe we, we might have some expectations from 2D and 3D gravity that uh, uh, the variance of some observable should actually be much smaller, should be some non-perturbative in N, like some e to the minus N. And so do you think that maybe this is because uh, here you're applying it to generic observables, which might also be light states in, in your theory, and so maybe if you consider observables, which uh, are, for example, dual to some uh, black hole states, then the variant should be non-perturbative in, in those cases? Th that was what I meant to suggest, indeed, with noting that we just looked at the light observables, yeah. I think you're right that it doesn't have the same pattern as the variances appearing in these low-dimensional holographic expectations, but there's no a priori reason to expect to match when you, th when you really think about it. Um, so, and I think that that's partly why. Um, it, it could also just be that it's just an analog, um, and there's not any literal relation of this variance to something like a space-time wormhole. But before we say so, we need to think about the black hole part of the theory. Yeah, thanks. I want to question, when you speak of arithmetic chaos, you have in mind that uh, the, the cusp forms, and maybe uh, in science, I don't remember about it in time, but the cusp forms, they are also against states of Hecke operators, yes. which act on the, on the yes. modular surface. Mm -hmm. So these Hecke operators, they come uh, as uh, Hecke correspondences between points, different points on the, on the surface. You know, they are these Hecke correspondences, which are arithmetic in nature. So, uh, I mean, do these uh, correspondences uh, play a role uh, also in the, in the observables? Okay. Are there correspondences between observables at different points? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, I, I don't know. That's a more sophisticated version of the kinds of questions I've been asking myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean... Because <coughs> when you spoke about the simplicity of the, of the, the discrete spectrum, I think I don't remember, but does the, does the logarithm bound concern the simplicity of the Hecke spectrum, that is uh, assuming that uh, you take eigenmodes of all Hecke operators together, or just the Laplacian uh, alone? No, that's a dif different question, but the uh, simplicity. I mean, if, you, if you impose that the joint spectrum is simple, or just the spectrum of the Laplacian? Um, hmm. Um, let's see. I, I think that the best the best bound this logarithmic best bound is y using under the most optimistic conditions. <laughs> so that's for the Yeah. So so assuming yeah so for the. But sorry, I mean. S saying that all of the forms are, are Hecke mass forms. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, is it? 
This, this is not logically equivalent to saying that the spectrum is simple, yes, but it would follow from the simplicity yes, of the spectrum. If, this, if the Laplace if the Laplace, right. uh, Laplace spectrum is simple, then the cos forms mm -hmm. must be eigenstate right. of the Hecker, yes, right. because the, there's only one joint eigenbasis which yeah, is exactly. the unique eigenbasis of the Laplacian. But if the Laplace eigen, eigen spectrum is not is right. not simple, then you, you can impose or not uh, to be also Hecker eigen modes. Yeah, but mm -hmm. well, I think the ones you tabulated, they are, they are, they are eigenmodes of the Hecke operators. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. And then these three coefficients, they also satisfy some some relations uh, due to this due yeah. to this uh, Hecke structure. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, all, all all evidence is consistent with the simplicity. That's for sure. Um, yeah. No more questions. Then thank you again, Eric.